Good morning. This is Jean Eaton, your practical privacy coach and practice management mentor with Information Managers. Now, just a reminder, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV. These are my recommendations based on my experience and research and not legal advice. What is the difference between a regulatory body and regulations and legal authority? So these terms get used almost in the same breath, but they are refer to very specific and different things. So let's take a look at how these terms are, uh, what these terms are and what they mean, and then we'll take a look at a specific example about how they apply to management of patient records. So a regulatory body is usually a professional college. So, for example, the College of Physicians and Surgeons or um, Alberta College and Association of Chiropractors or College and Association of Registered Nurses of Alberta. These are professional regulatory bodies. They set the standards of practice, including patient records documentation standards. But you need to remember that the minimum requirements is the legislation. In Alberta, our legal authority to collect, use, and disclose health information falls under the Health Information Act, the Health or the HIA. Now, we have other types of information in our clinic practices, and that might include employee or business information, and that would fall under the PIPA legislation, the Personal Information and Protection Act. So you can collect, use, and disclose employee information, and your legal authority to do that is the PIPA legislation. So every time that you want to collect patient information or employee information, you need to go to the specific legislation and determine, yes, Section 27 of the Act says I can collect patient information in these circumstances. That is your legal authority. Now, in the world of uh, acts and legislation, there is the act and there's usually a supplemental or, or a corresponding document called the regulations. So the act is fairly high level and then the regulations gets into greater level. So there's a companion document to the Health Information Act, which is called the Health Information Regulation. Another regulation that is a companion document is an Alberta Electronic Health Record Regulation. So we've got the regulatory body that sets the standards for their professional members. When we collect, use, and disclose health information, we have to follow the legal authority of the Health Information Act and the companion documentation about the health information regulation and the Alberta electronic health record regulations. So let's take a look about how this applies to patient records and this month's question specifically about a psychologist role in maintaining patient records in a clinic. So under the Health Information Act in Alberta, a custodian is specifically named in the Health Information Act. It must be a member of a regulated health profession that is named in the Health Information Act. So custodians include physicians, chiropractors, dental surgeons, dental mechanics, midwives, opticians, optometrists, and more. But it does not include a psychologist. So a psychiatrist is also a trained medical physician. Psychologists are not included in the list of custodians under the Health Information Act. Remember that the regulatory college sets the standards for documentation of patient records, as long as it doesn't conflict with the Health Information Act. The Health Information Act sets the minimum standards, and then the regulatory college can set additional standards. So when you have a psychologist working as part of a practice in a medical clinic, the psychologist is an affiliate to another custodian. So that might be a psychiatrist or it might be another physician, um, but they are an affiliate under the Health Information Act and they must follow the policies and procedures of both their college and the policies and procedures of the custodian of that healthcare practice that they are employed. So as part of the flow of patient information, the psychologist 
may receive from a physician, a psychologist, or somebody else. The patient will come and attend the psychologist at a meeting. And at that meeting, I would expect that the psychologist will have a discussion with the patient about how their information will be shared. This gives you the opportunity to collect the expressed wishes of the patient. So it is routine practice and a requirement that when you receive a referral for the care and treatment of a patient, that you send an acknowledgement back to the referring uh, provider to let them know that you have accepted the patient in care or not, and what your path forward is going to be. We'll follow with you or share a treatment plan, we'll assume the care of this patient, whatever those circumstances are. Now, you doesn't necessarily have to be a copy of the complete psychologist clinical notes. So that doesn't necessarily have to go back um, to the referring physician. It could be a summary of that information, or it could be more detailed. It depends on the conversation that you've had with the patient and what is part of your clinical practice and, and is appropriate for that care of the patient. Now, I have this conversation regularly about the use of shadow charts. So there is a concern by some people in uh, some psychologists that they keep um, very detailed notes and that they have a reason to keep those very detailed notes, but they don't want to, they want to make sure that their detailed notes are not accessible to people who shouldn't have access to it. So they want to keep shadow notes. They'll keep um, their own notes that they keep in a locked drawer in their office rather than having that information in the electronic medical record. And I would strongly suggest that this is not a good practice. And the reason for that is if you have shadow charts or you have a supplemental chart for that patient record, um, it's not having the same security in the EMR that the rest of the patient record is. So if there was a reason to be able to access that patient record um, in an, an urgent situation, we wouldn't necessarily know that somebody else had shadow charts for that patient somewhere else. So the records would be incomplete. But more fundamentally, in your organization, if you have concerns about people looking up patients' records who shouldn't have access to it, that they are snooping, then that's a bigger problem, and you need to address that problem. If you're using electronic medical records, you can get very granular or a great level of detail about making sure that you have the appropriate role-based access to those particular patient notes. So if that's a concern about your practice, then you need to address that concern. And I don't think the solution is having shadow patient notes. And not everybody will agree with me. This is my opinion. And in my experience as a health records manager in health records departments across Canada and consulting with individual patient practices um, across Canada, this is my best suggestion and recommendation for you. You need to fix that big problem and shadow charts are not the solution. So make sure that you have addressed your referral process, you have a conversation with the patient about what you will and will not share, and make sure that you've properly documented the express wishes of the patient so that the patient has confidence that you're going to share only the information that you have agreed to share. Um, and make sure that you have those security systems in place so that you can have the appropriate role-based access. This is Jean Eaton, your practice management mentor and practical privacy coach. If you like this episode, please subscribe to this channel and add your honest feedback to the comments below so that people who like what you like can find this podcast.